Rex, hey, it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, especially uh, before your film festival that's uh, coming up uh, pretty soon. So congratulations once again for your film, Space Baby. Hey, thank you so much. More of a congratulations, it's being showcased at one of the most prestigious film festivals in the world with, with the Dances with Films. How do you feel about that, Rex? I think it's great because, you know, when I started this film 25 years ago, Sundance was still kind of an indie kind of place. A lot of these festivals were taking, you know, small indie films without famous people. But these days, um, Dances with Films really focuses on indie, uh, indie films, like not big budget um so there's a real passion for that and um I, I just couldn't be a better place uh and and it turns out they um they started the festival exactly when i filmed the film oh really 20, 26 years ago yeah like that same summer um and so it's perfect that this is the 26th anniversary and uh of both my film and the and the festival well then tell us what sparked you to do uh, space baby in the first place um, well, I have, I had, um, two kids and another one came along that just looked like a little alien, just a little astronaut, like a Gerber baby on steroids. He was so cute. And, um, before, I think before he was born, his older brother is, um, uh, just a kind of lunatic, funny kid. Um, he's now an LA times tech reporter, you know, so he's always been into technology, <laughs> um, and he, Sam, uh, was at a blender one day and he was, he was going, bzz, 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 it's alive, it's alive, <laughs> like some kind of mad scientist thing. <laughs> and, uh, and somehow that we, he and I sparked this idea of like, what if you, you know, really wanted a baby brother and you tried to create your own. And, um, and I wrote a little short story about it. And one of my friends in Boston said, oh, you should turn this into a feature film. And, uh, you know, and so here I am 25 years later and uh, I finally, finally finished it. So. <laughs> well, that's uh, excellent to hear. So tell us uh, why the journey 25 years? Are, are you like James Cameron waiting for technology to improve before you, uh, you, you go into production? That's exactly right. This is all my plan. Um, no, nah, what happened is, um, there's a lot of things because in some ways the film didn't make sense when I finished it. It, it, it just like, it, it read that it made sense, but when you actually watch the footage, you're like, wow, what the hell is going on here? And, um, so it took a few years to, to make it make sense, like five years. But the real problem is that my, um, a really good friend and investor died. Um, mm. shortly after we finished filming and, um, you know, so if I'd had any money, I'm sure I could have finished it 20 years ago. Um, but I, I worked on it for about five years until I just ran out of steam and I had to focus on raising the kids and getting them through schools. And, you know, and I was in a town that didn't have great schools. So we sent them to private schools and, and, uh, I just had to put it aside for about 15 years until they all grew up and got out of college and got jobs. And then I could start say, you know, putting my, my extra money back into the film uh, about five years ago. Um, so that's, cause I never was a, a great producer. I didn't raise money. I just had a friend who, who said, Hey, if you ever want to make a film, I'd be happy to give you money. Um, and I'd, I'd asked him for a hundred thousand dollars and he said, look, if you really want to do this, I'll give you 500,000. And if you want more, just let me know. Um, He's a, a friend who made a billion dollars on Wall Street. So I was pretty lucky to have a friend like that. <laughs> so, the, so the film production itself took place over 20 years ago. And, it, and I'm assuming that the kids were your kids at the time? They still are, yeah. But in, in 1997, we shot the film, yeah. So they were, um, the, Sam was eight years old. The, he calls himself Mental Man, Sophia. Uh, calls herself nature girl she was six and then um, the baby was 18 months old space baby wow so how how did that production go uh, back then how how did you pull it off because one of the things that the uh, in hollywood always say is never to work with children and you did that and it's your own children yeah not only not, don't work with children but we had uh, a dog and a ladybugs and a cat and some parakeets and you know all sorts of things that you're not supposed to i 
I grew up on a farm in Colorado and I just had this gung ho attitude. Like I can do anything. And, uh, you know, it really gets you into trouble because, you know, you don't, you wouldn't do things if you knew better. Um, but it, it was interesting. They, um, the first day, um, the, f sorry, the first day that we, um, shot the, we had a very difficult scene where the main character had to pretend he, you know, was seeing a baby that no one else could see. And, um, the whole crew, you know, the, the department heads, they pulled me aside and they said, Hey, look, we, we could get real kid actors because this isn't going very well. And, you know, we could get real kid actors in before we, you know, go any further. And I said, look, my investor friend and I, we don't want to make a movie in general. We want to make a movie with these kids. So, so no. And they ended up being so natural and um, just uh, did a great job. I mean, they both had perfect memories. They knew every line of every character in the film, you know, just that kind of memory. Um, so uh, anyway, the production went well. Um, we, did, we shot for about 30 days. Um, at our house and the rest home next door and the forest um, right nearby. Uh, and I knew I didn't want to move um, anywhere because uh, that would just, you know, take a lot of time and effort. So we tried to do it all in one place. <laughs> and not, not to mention the technology was quite uh, different uh, 20 years ago. Uh, could you, could you talk about uh, what kind of technology that you actually use? Because, uh, because I know, uh, you know, CGI and green screen is not, not not the same today as it was uh, 20 years ago. Honestly, well, first of all, you know, we shot it on 35 millimeter film um, because there was no HD. This was before uh, YouTube existed, before Google, before FaceTime, before iPhones, um, before smartphones. So um, it's the technology was definitely like film. And I literally had the idea that for some of the visual effects, we would um, maybe scratch the negative to make it look like lightning was coming down. You know, I had no idea of what was possible. And, you know, I've been trying to remember somehow I lucked into a guy who was at um, DreamWorks working on Captain America. And he made the satellite in GoldenEye, the Bond movie, and was just a really great expert at making uh, 3D models. And he came out and spent a summer with us and got us started on, on CGI. I had no idea um what you know how much would have been possible but at one point we had 24 nt workstations you know these are I, what were nts 84 86s 85 86s but way back in the day 24 you know and each one was like a thousand bucks back then two thousand bucks working round the clock for like three years because a single frame would take 24 hours mm -hmm. and now you know, now any of our like Apple watches are faster than all 24 put together. I mean, it's crazy what you can do now with, with visual effects. So, so in, in truth though, the um, one technology that, you know, didn't exist back then um, was just the scanning of films or the, the price of scanning a single frame back then was like $3. And there's about a hundred thousand frames in a film. And so since I waited 20 years, that price came way, way down. So we were able to scan all 2 million frames of the film and then reassemble it and, uh, you know, get it color graded. So there's a lot of, um, uh, and, and I wanted to add some more ladybugs in the end. And so I, I got some guys in India to, to make some more ladybugs that I put all over the film. So um, that, none of those existed, you know, like the, the things like Fiverr and, the, you know, uh, collaborating with with guys in India didn't exist back then so um, so in a way I'm glad it took the time it took because it couldn't it wouldn't have been as good as as it turned out so so waiting became a positive result uh, for you that 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 sounds terrific well in a bigger way you know it's back so I, I you know you've seen the film I have not not yet oh, okay um, well, it's about these little kids fighting a fascist nurse, right? And she's an actual fascist. Like she's, you know, like a swastika wearing, you know, and, and at the time it was meant to be kind of historic reference, kind of a, you know, almost a comical thing. Um, but 25 years later, there's just like a real rise of fascism in the world. 
And the, um, and the film is about the decline of the earth, the, the soul of the earth is dying. And these little kids need to rebuild the Holy Grail to get a new soul for the earth. Well, 25 years ago, we didn't know just to what extent the earth was in trouble, you know? And so it's way more timely. And then there's a kind of black history, um, civil rights history in the film. Mm -hmm. And 25 years ago, there was no black lives matter. There was no discussion of these things. So in a way it was, um, it, it's way more uh, likely to be well received today than it could have been 25 years ago. It's way more timely today than it was then. So, well, you um, can't argue against that. I mean, we're, we're having an Indiana Jones movie in a couple of weeks, and he's still fighting Nazis for all these years. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we did, who knew though? I mean, we all thought that was historic, and now there really is a a real, you know, a swing toward authoritarianism in the world and. Um, you know, so I'm happy to have, you know, my slight part in trying to wake people up and, you know, and, and show how it's uh, linked to greed and, and uh, destroying the planet, you know. Now, um, tell, tell, tell us about the rest of your cast. You, you mentioned that you had a fascist nurse. I, I, I did see the trailer. So, uh, I mean, it, look, it looks very entertaining. I do have to admit. It is. It's, it's wacky. I mean, it's certainly, it's like there's, I would really pay a thousand bucks if somebody could predict what happens next in the film. Cause it's just, you know, it's crazy. No one, you could not predict what's going to happen next. Cause it makes, it's not that it doesn't make sense. It does make sense in the end, but it's not like any story you've seen before. Um, one thing the, that's really cool is the, um, the evil nurse who works for the devil um, was, you know, sort of modeled on the wicked witch of the West and nurse ratchet, of course. But the, um, what's, what's interesting is that that nurse is actually um, a preschool teacher, just like Margaret Hamilton was, who was the Wicked Witch of the West. And in fact, though, the nurse is, um, is the godmother of the little girl in the film, Sophia. So it was actually my wife's best friend played the evil <laughs> nurse. So they could, they could go at it and fight each other because they were, you know, this little girl and this nurse were like best friends. And so... It was really fun to see how courageous, you know, the Sophia could be, um, partly because she knew, you know, the actor so well. With, with a film like this and working with children and animals, is there a, is there a lot of room for improv or basically just to just let the film go? <laughs> it's um, or put another way: is there any room for getting what you want? You know, is there any room for a scripted? Um, you know, what was um, what was interesting is that the um, the baby we all called it candy based acting, where a character, if you wanted the, him to touch your hand, you would hide candy in your hand, and he would reach for the candy. <laughs> so, if you wanted him to run across the forest, you would offer him something. You know, like here's a treat. So it was, you know, very. Um, I, he did a great job. I, you know, when you watch it, you're like, how on earth did they get this baby? to do these things. And honestly, I don't know, you know, we, I had a great editor who would find moments and pull them out, but it looks like this baby is doing, you know, what, uh, doing what a director would want him to do. And in fact, you know, you can, you can offer candy, but you cannot make babies do anything you want them to do exactly. You know? So, um, I forgot the question, but, uh, <laughs> it's, uh yeah. Um, I think not, except for the baby. Basically, whatever the baby did is what we filmed and what we used. That's that's mm -hmm. the truth. With the other kids, it was all pretty much, you know, scripted and remembered and hitting their marks and, and all that. Um, I think it, I definitely will, you know, in future films, because I got another half dozen to make, um, I'll be way more comfortable with improv and, and uh you know, because if you know what you want and you know that that's sufficient, you can do that and then just open it up to, you know, what the actors want. Um, so now it's uh, 25 years later, your children's all grown up with regular jobs and so on. And and uh, the rest of your cast had a chance to, have, you know, watch the film. What, what are their reactions now to something that they filmed long time ago? Well, you know, since I moved from Boston, um, the rest of the cast hasn't had a chance to see it. Um, mm. One um, 
so Peter Wolf from Jay Giles band um, was, was a friend. He does, he plays an electronics store clerk um, and the evil nurse hasn't seen it. Um, one thing I was really uh, pleased with today, I got a message from, uh, so, so the, the black guy in the film, Charlie Brown um, was a great Broadway actor who had played like a lot of um, August Wilson's plays like King Headley and Fences. Mm -hmm. And and he acted with um, Denzel and James Earl Jones and um, um, Viola Davis and Samuel L. Jackson and basically all the you know top top black actors in America, and um, he, he was someone that was I loved working with so much that we started planning our next films together. You know there was a there was a great jazz musician who was murdered outside a club once. And so Charlie Brown, this actor's name said, you know what I've always wanted to play as a guy that I heard about growing up, lived in uh, Brooklyn, I think. And he would, was blind, but he would transcribe other musicians notes, you know, cause a lot of the musicians couldn't, you know, write down their melodies. And so even though he's blind, he would still do that. And so he would be a detective, you know, and we were going to make a detective story and Charlie played it. Well, Shortly after we finished filming, he got um, was diagnosed with cancer and died yeah. three or four years later. Um, but just to, so, and his niece uh, is Yvette Nicole Brown, oh, who is on Community, and yeah. uh, so <laughs> I'd been in touch with her a couple of years ago to tell her about the film. And just yesterday, I, I wrote and said, "Hey, we're actually finally finished it, and um, it'd be great if you come see it." Well, she's in Ohio visiting her dad, who was the big brother of Charlie Brown. And her dad is ailing, you know, he's probably 80 or something like that now. And, um, and she said, oh, it would be so, he would love to see it because it was the final film of his little brother, you know. Mm. And so <laughs> I just sent her, I sent her a link to it, you know. So she said, oh my God, we're going to have a movie night. This is going to be so great, you know, that we get to watch this film um so anyway so his uh his big brother will be able to see it uh at least well that's that that's wonderful it's um ho hopefully a lot of people will have a chance to see it at dances with films too so i hope so i'm i'm certainly um sending out text messages and emails to everyone i know uh and uh yeah i guess it's a 300 seat theater so there's still i think there's still tickets uh <laughs> Rex, uh, t tell me uh, what's a love? What's your love for indie films and how you got started in this business? Uh, I think. Well, first of all, my parents were both kind of avid photographers and um, and sixteen millimeter, eight millimeter filmmakers. Um, they were pilots, and uh, and so growing up out west, you know, they would. Um, you know, we always had like a little movie camera and, and film cameras in the, um, in the house. So I think I made my first film when I was 12. Um, it was about uh, my brother and I were bank robbers. I was Billy the Kid and we robbed a bank and we kidnapped these little kids. And it was all, you know, you have to edit it while you're shooting because we didn't have an editor. So you just have to stop and then start and have little cards because there's no sound. And then I, I like making stop motion films, um, you know, where, you know, you're just someone's moving across a field without moving, you know, where you just stop. Um, but I think I really fell in love with the idea of by, I grew up in a town, Fort Collins, Colorado, that had a um, university and they had a student, student center that didn't check IDs, you know, for uh, age appropriateness. And I went to see um, Clockwork Orange probably a mm. dozen times. And just fell in love with Kubrick stuff and just the, you know, just the zany angles and the driving scenes and everything about it. Um, you know, and apparently he made that whole film with like one lighting kit, you know, that mm. it was a truly just super creative, um, very uh, resourceful film. So I love, I guess I would just always love the idea of making things with what you have rather than what you want. You know, like, I'd like a castle, but we have, you know, uh, a barn. So we'll use a barn. And, uh, you know, so that, like, everything in my film was stuff that, you know, we had and that, or that ideas that friends gave us or, um, 
you know, just props we had. So it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't like the sort of Hollywood attitude, which is I've dreamed of some amazing thing. You go pay for it. It was, uh, what do we have? What could we do? What could we possibly do with this crazy stuff we've been collecting at yard sales and, you know, things like that. So, um, so yeah, both, I, I came from a family of kind of creative people and then, uh, and then seeing, um, probably Kubrick more than anything, um, as far as indie film, uh, I, I do aspire to be, uh, become part of the machine, uh, next time, one of these times and, uh, you know, work with, um, better, more resources. Cause it's, I definitely don't plan for any film to take more than a year after this one, you know, now mm. that I know, now that I know what I'm doing. Um, I think I can finish films within one year. Um, anyway, to answer your question, I've long, long winded, but <laughs> no, it's not, it's not a problem. I, w I was going to ask you as a, was there any regrets, uh, you know, spending so much time on space baby and so, cr so much creation, creative creativity for, for this film? I mean, did, did you wish you had a, like a much bigger budget or you rather skip that and be proud of what you got? I'm super proud of what I got. And that's, I kind of worked until I'm proud of it. And, and um, so what happens is when you don't have enough money, um, you, you know, you take all these compromises. So when we got the film scanned, the guys who did it left all this dust on it, hundreds of thousands of pieces of dust. And so I, an intern and I, you know, just circled every piece of dust. I mean, it might be 500,000, right? So that took a year because I didn't want, when you watch it to just be like, Dust, 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 you know, sparks, spots. Um, similarly, when, uh, I mean, I'll tell you what I learned, though. The answer is um, I do regret working on my own for so long. Um, I tried hiring different people who often were worse than I was. And so mm. I would just say, I'm just going to go back and do it myself. Until recently, um, there's a, a, um, a guy I'd met named Matt Dean, same last name. Um, and he's just started working for a place called Smart Post and Sound in Burbank. And it's a place that does like 30,000 hours of TV a year. And, um, you know, they'll do shows like Reacher or something like that and, and have, um, they'll just have 12 hours to do all of the footsteps, all of the door slams, all of the Foley, you know. And um, whereas I would take 12 months to do that because I don't have any of these pits of, you know, sand and leaves. And, you know, for, in my film, if you hear people walking on leaves, it's, it's really me rubbing tissue paper together like that, you know? <laughs> and, and so um, just, just about a month ago, right. when I found out, I got into dance with the films, there's like, okay, you need to create this DCP, which is a certain kind of quick time or, you know, a certain kind of video and a five, one mix, you know, ideally so that you got surround speakers. And so I contacted this, this friend, Matt Dean. I said, hey, could you do this? And he said, well, I've started working for this place. You got to come see it. In, in the space of uh, really literally like one minute, they could fix something that I couldn't fix in a week. And, mm. and with Space Baby, especially because it took, it took so long to kind of make it make sense, a lot of the dialogue was recorded a year later um, when, the, when Sam his voice was like, I'm a little eight year old. Now I'm a 13 year old. How do you make a 13 year old sound like an eight year old? Right. And, uh, and Charlie Brown, you know, I would go down to New York and grab another few lines from him. I, I, the last time I got to him, he was in a hospital gown, like nearly dying. I mean, still Charlie, you got to say a few more lines, you know? Well, how do you get lines recorded in New Jersey and New York and Chicago? I think he did some lines to sound like they happened in a forest outside Boston or to sound like they're, you know, and, and again, I could spend a week on that and it'd be like, eh, it's okay. These, the guys at the smart post sound, just like, bam, they knew what tool to use, you know, how to EQ it. And I, so that made me feel really stupid because in the end, I would have been better if I'd got a job washing dishes to raise the money to hire good people than for me to spend two or three or four years doing this stuff myself. So, um, so that's a, you know, to answer your question, I mean, it's a real labor of love and I wish I'd been smarter, um, but, uh, you know, whatever, what can you do? <laughs> well, hey, you're, you know, you're 25 years wiser at, the, at this point, but uh, you mentioned before 
What's, what's coming up next uh, for you? You said uh, you have a few projects in the pipeline. Can you talk about them? Yeah, sure. I, I like, um, I, I mean, I, I like talking in general, like to other people at parties and things, because um, most of my ideas, no one would copy. And so they're safe. And, uh, and then they'll, they'll often have um, other ideas. So there's, there's two main things I'm working on. First of all, I have some screenplays from uh, 20 years ago that I love. One is called Kids Rule. These kids start a homework help club. They realize that kids need more than homework help. They have dire situations. And so these kids take over the world using quantum computing. And it's called Kids Rule. You know, So I love that. Um, another one is about a guy who's found the kind of biological basis of being soulmates. And it starts a company for that. You know, So it's called Soulmate. Um, but... but Right now, I'm working on two things. One that I hope will be on on someplace like Hulu, and it's about. Um, so I'm a I'm a singer. I've always loved singing, and in fact, in Space Baby, I wrote myself in as an aspiring opera singer, and I was going to put myself in, and it turned out I was not a very good actor, and I, <laughs> I, I, cut, I cut myself out. It's just like this character is not needed at all, and I remember my you know at this point I was probably. Um, a year after we, you know, we're into post-production and I, I came out of the editing suite and I said to my daughter, I said, man, you know, I just cut myself out of the movie. I said, I think I just realized that, that good acting is doing nothing. And she said, you just realized that, you know, <laughs> the good acting is not trying to be acting. It's just, just being there, you know, she, and she was uh, so natural. Um, so, but my real goal though was to showcase my singing. And in fact, um, one of my friends is, uh, he, he quit college to tour with Wynton Marsalis. He's a great saxophone player. Mm -hmm. And I needed a song that was kind of about civil rights because this, you know, I wanted the movie to end with this great message of peace and love and, you know. And so um, Dizzy Gillespie had a partner named Connie Bryson who had written a song um, kind of about Martin Luther King, but it's called Together. And it's, it's kind of an anthem, you know, and it's, um, and the woman who sang it was just one of the most, really one of the prettiest voices in America. Um, and I just said, who is that? Who is that singing? We have to get her in the movie. And she and I will sing this song together because I wanted to showcase me singing. And um, her name was Cindy Mizell. And the crazy thing is, so she was one of Luther Vandross's backup singers then. Hmm. And, um, and I, I, I will edit this music video together because, like I said, I cut myself out of the movie. I cut that whole scene out at the end where everyone's kind of singing the song together. But I left her singing it. Um, and uh, she it was pregnant at the time with, um, and again, this is 26 years ago, with a baby who is now, the, um, and I forget his name, but he's like the captain of the L.A. Rams. Like he's, a, he's an NFL player. And that little baby is like in my movie. <laughs> um, and uh, now I forgot the question. Uh, what was, was the question? Talking, we were talking about your upcoming projects. Oh, yeah. So anyway, the point is I've always been a singer, right? And so I was going to stick myself <laughs> in the movie. And I had to cut myself out because I'm a bad actor. I have been. I mean, I'm getting better. That's my goal is to get better. Um, so I, 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 when I came out to L.A., I... I um, I met a, um, a great bunch of musicians and one of them, uh, a guy named Daryl Diaz, is a, he'd produced a lot of Maxwell. He's a great keyboard player. He used to tour with Sade and Seal and people like that. And, and so we put together like 20 songs and I've been right before the COVID hit. And I've been working on the film, but, you know, working on these songs. And, and one thing as a musician, you, you realize like it's so hard not to be completely irrelevant. You know, 100,000 new songs come out every day. If you put out a music video that you spent ten thousand dollars on, maybe sixty-seven people will see it. You know, it's just like, it's just depressing, right? So, you know, I thought, how can I um, make my hair doesn't usually look like this? Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> how? Uh, oh, but speaking of which, though, this is on my to-do list today. Is um, speaking of kind of crazy hair, um, Peter Wolf from Jay Giles Band used to be roommates with David Lynch. And so I'm going to try to get hold of David Lynch's publicist and see if he will come see this movie because he would appreciate how crazy it is and the, you know, philosophical it is. Um, but anyway, so I met, I met a French composer like six months ago who took the time to listen to all me singing. And he said, Oh my God, you know, I'm so proud to meet you. You got to come in and meet my producing partner. 
maybe think of a you know some way we can work together and i started thinking well if i did if i wrote my film my songs into short films i could get them into festivals and at least a few thousand people would see it not just mm -hmm. 60 you know yeah and so one of my songs i said you know what this song would be so good in a movie about a vampire with alzheimer's right <laughs> And so, because it's a, it's a kind of uh, impossible dream the song you're singing where you're dying. And it's actually about Alzheimer's. So, but a vampire with Alzheimer's, it, you know, presents some interesting, like, wow, what do you do with a guy like that? You know, like maybe mercy kill him or what? And so I wrote this like um, 20 page screenplay. I wrote four of my songs into it and I started telling people about it. And they, you know, two of one, they're all like, this has to be a TV show. This should go on for like eight years. And so I've got a, a band of vampires who are kind of like rage against the machine, you know, social justice musicians, but they actually try to solve world problems in every episode, kind of like quantum leap kind of thing. <laughs> and, you know, it's just a comedy, but, you know, still talk about important world issues. Um, and uh, so that's been really fun to, you know, I won't tell you all the details of it, but it's, it's really fun to think of a kind of vampire thing that's never been done before with, um, just a whole different twist. Nobody's wearing black, you know, it's, um, they're all really nice guys, you know, <laughs> but it's still gonna be fun. And then, uh, and then another, uh, again, I think this idea is too stupid to steal. So I'll tell it. Um, but I had this idea of what if there was a, uh, you've heard of Pir Pilates, right? Pilates. Yeah, yeah. Pilates. Yeah. Well, what if there was an exercise movement called Pirates that was really pirates, <laughs> And, and you and you swabbed the decks and you climbed ropes and you had eye patches and you had parrots and you sword fought now all these core exercises so i've had this idea for like 10 years like what could i do with this it's you know so dumb maybe tiktok videos and it turns out a friend of mine is a brazilian actress who was a clown for years back in brazil like you know going to hospitals and working with kids and i started telling her about it and she started inhabiting this character you know she's like okay i've got the eye patch i got the parrot i've got the you know i've got the peg leg and, um, and so I'm working on a kind of no budget film about her um, trying to raise money to get back to Brazil to donate a kidney to her ailing mother. And, uh, and so even though I promised myself I wouldn't work on any like, you know, low budget films anymore, this one is just so fun and so goofy that, um, you know, I, I really want to try to do it later on this summer. <laughs> wow. Sounds like you're, you have a... You have a full plate there, Rex. So, hey, congratulations uh, for Space Baby. And um, I'm going to be at Dances with Films, too. So I'm going to definitely check out uh, Space Baby there. Oh, awesome. I, I can't wait for you to see it. You know what? I can't wait to, to see it, too. And and uh, hopefully I don't have to wait 25 years for any of your other projects. But uh... <laughs> Yeah. Well, you realize as you get older that you don't live forever. So uh, that's... Uh... That's my advice to young people. Realize that you don't live forever and get shit done. Get stuff done. There we go. I'll, 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 I'll see you at the theater next time. All right. Thank you so much. It's great. Great meeting you. I'll see you then.